our school, when they integrated, they never did start to sponsor a school prom. So they left it up to the parents to have a prom for their children. That's how it ended up having a white prom and a black prom all these years. But when we became juniors toward the beginning of the end of our junior year and the beginning of our senior year, we decided that we get along with everyone. We all do everything together. So there was no reason for us to have a prom that excluded any one of us. Uh, and, uh, Brandon, what's been the reactions, first, of your fellow students, and then also of uh, parents uh, uh, of the students uh, to this idea? Well, at first, we had a whole bunch of students who you could tell they wanted to support it, but they were too scared to stand out and stand against not their, their peers, but their parents. But as time progressed and time's gone we, on, we've had more and more students change, come help us out, and we've actually had more parents. At first, it was like parents were like, well, it's tradition. Let's just stay it this way. But after time and their children change, you're like, hey, I'm going to support my children. This is their memory. Let's go. Brandon, did you ever go to the white prom? No, ma'am. And how is it that the white parents would not allow in black students? Well, since it's a private event, they have all the power they want, and they can say, hey, None of the black kids can come because it's just private. And that's just protected them against all these laws. So, Marisha, um, the homecoming queen this year, the prom queen, she's African American, and the, um, the prom, I don't know what you call him, king, is white. Um, yes, ma'am. The home, they're actually the homecoming king and queen. And yes, um, the king is white and the queen is black. So, um, was the queen able to go to the prom, to the white prom? Um, it was actually the homecoming dance that she was not allowed to go to. Um, and they also would not let the king and queen take pictures together for our school yearbook. Wow. Uh, I want to ask you about an article uh, written by Wayne McGinty in the uh, Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He's a city council member in Rochelle, Georgia. Uh, McKinney writes, uh, the truth is, Wilcox County has traditionally had two proms by choice, not coercion, personal preference and not pressure. There has not been any attempt to block or prevent students from holding an integrated prom. And, in fact, the community has supported both proms in the past by participating in student fundraisers. Uh, we're certainly not perfect in Wilcox County, but we're not as different from any place else as uh, we may have been portrayed in the media. Uh, this sounds like an argument for a separate but equal, but uh, I'd like to get your response. In response to that, that would be like completely false information because if it's the, they saying that tradition is the reason that's just their way of ha making a cop out because they don't want to acknowledge the fact that if adults had have done what they were supposed to do, then we as students would not have been having to do this right now because our community is so very small minded and racism runs really deep here. No one wants to acknowledge that because they've been living in this for so long. But reality is that students not wanting it or a not coming up with the idea is like that's false information. He did not tell the truth about that. Um, the, your governor, uh, the Georgia governor, Republican Nathan Deal, was asked by a group called Better Georgia to publicly support your integrated prom, as some Republican and Democratic state officials have already done. Governor Deal's spokesman, Brian Robinson, responded by attacking the group rather than addressing the question. He wrote, quote, This is a leftist front group for the state Democratic Party, and we're not going to lend a hand to their silly publicity stunt. The statement forced Governor Deal to clarify his position. He later told a reporter at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, quote, I believe that anything that's associated with school should not have the distinction or discrimination made based on race or gender or any other separation, but it appears to me that the parents and students have worked that out on their own, as they should. Um, Brandon, your response? Well, first, I'd have to say, by what he said, it really shocked me. And as me having a military part of a background, I've never heard anyone 
quote unquote commit political suicide so fast. And just by saying that, does he not realize the students who are supporting this and putting this together are ages of 17 and 18 in legal voting age? He just like, it just, it really, really <laughs> dug deep with me. Wow. Um, Mauricia, are you excited about the prom tomorrow night? Yes, I'm completely stoked for prom tomorrow night. I am. I, I don't think I've been this excited in a in long, long time. It's been a while. And, and Brandon, have you been surprised by the response uh, on the internet? People offering to uh, financial support uh, uh, for your efforts to organize this integrated prom. I was, I'm amazed, and I'm just overwhelmed by all the people in the world that want to help us. It just it shows how great the world really is, even though most of the time we can't see it. Well, we want to thank you both for being with us. In a moment, we're going to talk, Mauricia, to your mother. And we've been talking to Mauricia Rucker and Brandon Davis. Um, but as we talk about segregation in the U.S. that continues to this day, I want to go back to 1957, when a group known as the Little Rock Nine integrated Little Rock Central High School in Arkansas. This was three years after the Supreme Court's landmark decision in Brown v. Board of Education declaring segregation of public schools unconstitutional. The first time the students tried to attend what had previously been an all-white school, they were turned away by the National Guard on the orders of Arkansas Governor Orville Falbus. The second time, they were met by a mob of more than a 1,000 people who beat the African-American journalists who were there to cover the story. Finally, President Dwight Eisenhower sent in the Army to escort the students to school. Well, the youngest member of Little Rock Nine was Carlotta Walls Lanier. She was 14 when she was faced with the mob, along with eight other students. I interviewed Carlotta earlier this month at the National Conference for Media Reform in Denver and asked her to describe that historic day, December 25, 1957, when the Little Rock Nine finally integrated Little Rock Central High School. That was a wonderful day because we had a, a jeep in front and a jeep in the back, and we were in station wagons and fixed bayonets, guns, the whole nine yards. They were there to protect us and see to it that we got into the school. Once we got into the school, um, we all had an individual bodyguard. Uh, the troopers were all up and down the uh, uh, hallways. Uh, they didn't come into the classrooms, but they were up and down the hallways. And um, that is how I went to school and for, for the year 57, 58. Uh, a helicopter was buzzing over the school. The 1,200 troopers were bivouacked out, out on the football field and the grounds and so forth those first two or three weeks. And um, uh, I, I don't wish that on any young person, but... Uh, it, but that's what was necessary for us to get our education, and I'm happy that it took place. So they kept out the angry mob of a thousand outside the school. But what about inside? Hundreds and hundreds of white students, a sea of white inside the walls of the school. Right. Thousands. It was 2,100 uh, students that went to this school. And uh, I cannot say that they were all against me because they weren't. Uh, but there was a concentrated group of people that only came to school to make it miserable for us. Uh, at least that's how I viewed it. And, uh, and, and they, they made a concerted effort to do that. We were pushed, slammed into lockers down staircases, you know, ink in our seats, spittle, spat upon, you know, constant name calling, those sort of things. So what gave you the strength, Carlotta? You were 14 years old? I, I knew I was right. And when you know you're right, you just seem to be able to, and I had faith that, that I would be protected. Uh, that I knew I was doing the right thing. And uh, I considered that group of people who, especially the name callers and so forth, you know, just a bunch of ignorant people. And I was not about to stoop to their level. And it was their problem. I decided that this situation was their problem because we were within the law. We were doing what was right.
we had a right to be there. The Supreme Court decision had given us that right. That was Carlotta Walls Lanier, youngest member of the Little Rock Nine. She was 14 years old when she integra integrated Central High. Her book is called A Mighty Long Way My Journey to Justice at Little Rock Central High School. Well, we're going to end this segment back in Georgia with Tony Rucker, who has been helping her daughter, Mauricia, and other students who've organized the first integrated prom at Wilcox County High in Georgia, which will be held on Saturday night. Mauricia is still with us. Uh, Tony Rucker, as you listen to Carlotta um, talk about her journey in 1957, um, Tell us very briefly about um, the journey you and Marisha took to challenge segregation in Wilcox. Um, well, first of all, you know, I'm so thankful for Miss Carlotta as well as the other eight who integrated. And so from that, they give us strength to continue to do, you know, what we've been doing for the past year now. Um, you know, it, it has been a, a trying process. But through it all, these kids have planted their feet and they said, we're going to do this. And so as a parent, you know, I have to get on board with something that is right, you know, something that is good for the community collectively and something that unifies us, unifies us all, showing that there is no difference between us, you know, aside from the color of our skin. So um, it, it's been a fight, but it's been the best fight that I've had, you know, in my lifetime, I'll say. And finally, your feelings about your daughter, who's sitting right there next to you, Mauricia? Um, as I said uh, before, Webster has not created words yet. Um, as a parent, this is one of the most, you know, rewarding things that, that, that could happen, you know, to a parent to see their child um, display all of the morals and values that you instill in them you know, from very young. So to display that, to, to see her be, you know, strong and independent and, you know, fighting for such a worthy cause is an amazing uh, feeling as a parent. So rewarding. We thank you both for being with us. Marisha, any final words as you sit there glowing next to your mother, Tony? Um, if I had anything to say, it would just be that this has really been amazing, and I have become more of an humble person because of it, and I just want people to understand that love has no color. Hmm. And Marisha, Marisha, has your mother given you a curfew uh, time for the prom night, <laughs> Saturday night? <laughs> well, mom's going to be there, so I guess my curfew <laughs> is whenever she leaves, I better be leaving. <laughs>